we're so glad we have this time together. That's the end. <laughs> you just quit <laughs> us and we finished. <laughs> Woohoo! And the Badger! Board Game Battle Show! It's gonna get wild! It's gonna get wacky! It might even get a little samey! We're gonna talk about board games and the board game industry! And, you know, we might talk about anything else we wanna talk about! Hey, hey, hey! Better known as Barry the Babysitter! How are you doing, my friend? Hello, Berkey, the uh, king of granddad, granddaddismment, granddaddment. Yeah. Yeah, yes, grand, granddaddy, daddy. <laughs> yes. Hello, chaps and chaps. Not chaps and chaps. Hello, babylites. The babylites. We are back with another Berkey and Badgers board game babble show. Happy and New today, Year to you all. Yes, Happy New Year. It is 2018, and everything is looking snowy. Yes, and very cold in Minnesota. Yeah, sure, you betcha. Very, very cold. 17 below zero this morning with 25 mile an hour below wind chills. Mm. So, yeah, a little bit nasty. Yes, and nice and mild here in France, where it ah. is, uh, it is uh, uh, 8 degrees Celsius. And there is a wind of around 60 to 70 kilometers an hour. Donc, uh, c'est pas mal. Oh. Il y a beaucoup so de... that's about 30 degrees, our, our, our temperature, I think. Fair yes, enough. roughly. Yes. Yeah, we could go for that. That'd be great. We're going to have some of that coming up this Wednesday and Thursday. So the cold snap is, is uh, hopefully going for a little while. But Yes, and they predicted snow tomorrow. So, yay! Ah, we got a fair amount of snow here, so it's good. Well, uh, we have an exciting show today. Uh, today we're doing the Knights of Babylon segment, and we are featuring the hit game Scythe by Stonemeyer Games. Super excited about doing that. We've got some things that make you go, hmm, to talk about. We've got a poll to talk about. We've got uh, the good, the not so bad, and the ugly. And then we've got an awesome babble topic today about the games of 2017. And we're going to go through our top 10 that we've played in 2017. So, Barry, tell me a little bit. What have you been up to? Oh, I've been up to lots of things, lots and lots of things. I'm preparing for so many Kickstarters which are coming out. Um, when I say preparing, it doesn't mean that I'm saving up all my money to buy these Kickstarters. No, I am, I am, I am working on, obviously, at the moment, the Seventh Continent soundtrack still for the, the expanded areas, uh, which is still going on. Um, I'm also doing some advertisement and publicity and demoing for Batman, which is coming from Monolith on February the 27th, um, which is a Batman game. Batman. Um, Batman. Batman. Also... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm waiting for one more. Jen! There it is. And anywho, um, there are two Kickstarters starting in March, which I'm involved with in helping with the, the campaign. One of them is called uh, Badass Force, which is a bluffing oh. deduction game where players will have a handful of cards, and these cards are like action movie stars from the 80s. And uh, what will happen is you're trying to deduce who is using which action star at what time, and you're trying to kill these other action stars as well and load up your weapons. It's a really nice kind of light, quick, well, not quickish, quickish kind of bluffing game, which is um, really, looks really, really great. And also in March is another game called a mortal eight from Munster games which is a kind of um drafting game very quick drafting game but it's it's different there's like hidden roles and there's different ways of getting powers it's not a very aggressive game but it is more kind of you know using these the items of other players using, using their buildings to give yourself the advantage and give you points so um yeah that's that's all the things that i'm working on it's all kickstarter related um maybe i should get back to reviewing videos in games <laughs> maybe yeah well you had a really good uh patreon update with your last update uh 
you know, I don't know how many uh, people know about that, but Barry actually has a Patreon account for board games everybody should. And if you haven't checked that out before, check it out. Uh, Barry puts out a monthly blog, and uh, it's really a really a neat thing. It's really well produced. He talks about all the things he's been doing and the podcast with me, the the videos that he's reviewing, all the projects he's been working on. And I highly recommend you check that out because it's very entertaining and uh, you do a really great job with that every month, Barry. Thank you. And if you want to find out more about what I'm doing, you can always go to boardgameseverybodyshoot.com and uh, everything is posted there as well. So, Yeah, absolutely. So what have you been up to, um, Grandpa? Well, that's that's a great segue there when you say Grandpa. So, I'm going to have to uh, keep doing that. We, <laughs> I'm getting a little long in the tooth, aren't I? <laughs> yeah. God so uh, we had a we had a great time over Christmas. But my daughter Hannah, uh, my oldest daughter, uh, she was uh, extremely pe- pregnant and she couldn't travel anymore. I mean, it was that that close, and so uh, she was really bummed out that we couldn't go to Christmas, that she couldn't come home and her family and. I have, she has one other uh, 18 month old son, Philip. So uh, Chris and Philip and Hannah were in Alexandria about an hour from us. So we made an audible. We made a, made a spur of the moment call. We said, we're taking Christmas to Alexandria. So we packed up the Suburban and we loaded up all the gifts and some games and game topper and off we go to Alexandria. All the food we, yeah, (laughs) you would count how many times, right? So uh, we end up uh, going up there and we play the game Port Royal. And while we're playing the game Port Royal, uh, Hannah starts having contractions. So she's going, oh, you know, and she's so cute. So that's happening. We get done. And uh, all of a sudden we decide to go in the other room and we're setting up Sushi Go Party. And we're going to play a big group because we had like nine people there and eight people, whatever. And so we're setting it up and we look over on the couch and here my daughter Hannah is laying on her side. And my wife is is kind of, you know, massaging her and saying comforting words and low tones. And we look over going, "Uh oh, something's going on. Well, Hannah was hearing her water pop and all of that kind of stuff. So we decide real quick, we're going to open up the gifts. So we start opening up packages. Hannah's standing up and she is, she's having these contractions while her family is opening up presents. (laughs) Oh, and so of course, what do you do? You take a picture. Oh dear. (laughs) Oh dear. uh, (laughs) That's a real true print that is. It was big fun, I got to say. She's such a trooper, but uh, she was enjoying the process. So thankful that Christmas was there. Long and short of it, they left uh, to the hospital. And two and a half hours later, we had a baby uh, girl, Elizabeth uh, Josephine Wagner, uh, eight and a half pounds. Uh, It was a simple, easy delivery for Hannah. Uh, It's her second child, but it went just so well. Uh, baby's super healthy. Hannah was just doing great afterwards. And uh, now they're experiencing the joys of really being a parent because they have two kids. Yeah. Yes. That's, as you said, you're not a real parent until you've had two kids. Oh my God. Exactly. Once you get two, then you, then you, then you really qualify. Yeah. And that's when the bad babysitter comes out in your ass. <laughs> Yeah, you know all about that. You've got Batman over there, and now we've got Batgirl. So who knows? <laughs> yeah, we've got a couple of friends who are working on um, Two Face because they got twins. So, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, Kabuki Kids in the house, and Ben is in the house. Hey, good to see you guys. Yeah, most only two point five hours. Mm, uh, the birth that's all oh, it yes. took for her to give birth yeah she's she goes quick <laughs> you could have squeezed in a game of sushi go before we could have got it in i know we could have yeah. anyway <laughs> well next time and i've just been crazy busy doing uh game toppers uh we are right in the middle of getting ready to do our fulfillment and our our late pledge manager is still open so anybody that missed the kickstarter campaign we have some really great uh 
pre-order package prices. Most of the Kickstarter prices have gone up now to, to more uh, our standard pricing structure, but we still have some package deals that are discounted seven, uh, several hundred dollars below the normal price. So if you want to get in on that, you can do that. And that's what's taking up all my time. It's, it's definitely full-time job, super energized though, and super excited. Uh, really can't wait to get these great gaming upgrades into everybody's hands. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Okay. That is exciting. Just a quick note that it, the game toppers are not universal. Uh, they're only available in for the States and Canada, if I'm correct. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, the game toppers are, are it, we can deliver them overseas. It's just horribly expensive. It mm -hmm. costs almost $600 to ship over to Europe, a game topper. Uh, so it, it, it gets a little cost prohibitive, but I'm working really hard on developing some international relationships for distribution so that we can ship them over in bulk, get them distributed in a much more cost effective manner. And that's something we're going to work on in the future. We have some good shipping situations that we're working on right now with Canada as well. And people are loving these game toppers. We had 30 of them at Board Game Geek Con, and they just, they're just having a blast. You can see we have a game topper set up here, um, and I have Scythe all set up. We just played uh, this Sunday night and uh, just had a blast. And uh, I have a hard time not playing on it now because it's just so so nice and so fun and modular and all of those kind of things. You got an affordable, cost-effective, you know, portable solution that that's really most most people can afford and turn your existing table into a really high-end gaming table. So pretty yes. cool. Yes, yes, Kabuki Aldi does love them. Yeah. Oh wow, he fell in love. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's an exciting thing, and I'm I'm so happy to be able to actually produce something like this. That th this really does make a difference in people's gamings, and really brings a lot of joy into people's hearts. And that when I hear all the reports of the people who are just loving theirs and that kind of stuff, and I can't wait till that happens with all of our backers. I'm I'm, I'm just pumped. I'm super excited. So with that, I think we can move on to our next section. Did you have anything else, Barry? No, let's move on. Uh, did did you say we do you have a new poll or a poll that we had on our guild last? Uh, not for the last show, but only for this show. Okay, so it's we'll we'll talk about our guild and having a poll a little bit later. And so I think we'll move on to our news segment. Things that make you go hmm. Things that make us go hmm. Board Game News. Berkey and Badger reflect on the current events that are happening in the board game industry. Some may be good, some may be bad, but they're all things that make us go, hmm. Yawn. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There you go, buddy. So, what things are making Barry go, hmm? Okay, the, the, the major thing, the thing that made me cry before Christmas um, mm. was that, yeah, yeah, it's very sad. Um, my The one and only podcast that I, not it's not the one and only, but the one that I listened to. Oh, did Sa Santa Claus quit broadcasting from the North Pole? He did indeed. He said he can't hack it anymore because so many reindeer, reindeers just uh, want to get him on the act and, and, and be his co-host, and he just can't hack it. Well, then, then the Reindeer Guild started their own podcast, and then everything went off the rails. Oh, it did indeed. It went yeah. up in the air because they, they're flying reindeer. So. Well, and then the elves, you know, they had to say something, and so they're <laughs> in there with the reindeers. And then it's a coup. You know, they're they're overthrowing Santa Claus. Oh yeah, yeah. There's even a, there's even a channel where some elves have disguised themselves as Santa Claus and actually done done the podcast there. Oh, way. I saw yeah. that. I hate that. Yeah, you know, horrible. there's one Santa. Okay, there's not twenty Santas, and I'm I'm sick of it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you, you walk down the street and there's one on one corner block, and then you see another one down the road in the front of the the big de department stores. Oh, isn't it? And they're just elves. Yeah, yeah, they're just elves. But yeah. anyhow. The sad news is my, my favorite, favorite number one podcast 
has stopped running. Um, this podcast is the Perfect Information Podcast with uh, oh. our friend Ben Maddox and yeah. his co-host Georgios Pal Palidinos. I probably pronounced that wrong, so sorry, Georgios. Um, unfortunately, they've stopped doing working together through differences of personality, uh, which is really sad news for me. I really enjoyed their show because it is it's it's very very crude number one but also very very profound and and it digs into the the social mind of um us as board gamers and also digs deep into you know really profoundly into the board games when they review them and i am heartbroken hmm. uh, which means that i have more time to listen to my number two podcast which is that one of dan hughes this game is broken Oh, yeah, that's a good show. Yes, yes. Yeah, they're funny. They are funny. Do you know what, Kevin? Oh, sorry. Do you know what, Berkey? Oh, I've got out what? of character there. Do you know what, yeah. Berkey? Dan what? has invited us to go on the show. Woo! At some stage. That's going to be awesome. Well, I love Dan. I met him at Dice Tower Con uh, and Matthew Judd and Dave Lutz. Uh, uh, and those guys are just funny, but... I'm I'm feeling uh, really sad about this here too with uh, um, with, ben. with Ben because uh, I mean that guy is super smart. He's super witty, super fun. Mm -hmm. um, so that's. But about don't worry, he's informed me that he's doing a another podcast with a very different twing to it, and okay. also George Josh is also looking into doing something else as well in the board game reporting industry i've yet to you know hear anything else from georgia but um i'm, I'm keeping in touch with these two guys because these two guys when they are together they are phenomenal but unfortunately you can't get them in the same room anymore so oh no fist yes. the cup huh yeah close to close to <laughs> hopefully that doesn't happen to oh, us well. that's that's too bad Yes. Well, I had something that's making me go home, and it's something that I heard in the news, and then it started when I when I heard it, it just caught me a little wrong because I didn't really understand the reasoning. I'm sure they had business reasons, and so there's no criticism. It just wasn't quite sure, excuse me, what that was all about. Well, what the news was, was that Plan B Games are starting another company called Next Move Games. And they've got a game that's supposedly more family weight, and it's called Reef from uh, uh, Matsuchi, uh, Emerson Matsuchi, who, who did, as many of you know, Century Spice Road and other, other really popular titles. Well, I didn't understand. You know, Plan B game already seems to already have kind of that family weight game. Uh, why are they doing an offshoot title company? So I made me go, hmm. Then secondly, I got thinking about other companies that seem to be doing this. You know, not so long ago, Fantasy Flight started up a new division called Windrider. Mm -hmm. It seems like you don't hear anything about it anymore. No. But it's like they're they're creating these offshoot names. I, I don't know exactly what's going on. Game Salute, uh, they started, they've actually got three different companies. One is Starling Games and one is Flying Meeple. I forget what the other one is, but it's like, you know, you know, Game Salute obviously had a lot of reputation issues, I think, and so they're trying to rebrand themselves, I think. But yeah, possibly. Uh, it just made me go, "What's up with all that?" Yeah, it, it's interesting. There are comp there are companies that do that, so they can kind of make a different style of game. You know, they're they're probably more reputable. It's like Days of Wonder; they're reputable for making a particular type of game but if the guys in responsible for days of wonder want to make like a a hardcore uh role-playing game or something else they they feel the need that they have to change the name and create a, like a sub category and i think that's what F fantasy flight have done um they they want to do some euro style games and so instead of calling it under the fantasy flight you know umbrella yeah. they put another umbrella which you know is the same team behind it, but you know it's it's a different air of a game. So it's, a, it's you know you're not you're not going to a, um, watch a love mystery film with Bruce Willis when you really want to watch Bruce Willis kick ass, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, I, it seems like you know these companies have done such a good job branding their brand. Uh, 
to to have to separate it from their brand seems like they're rebuilding in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and they already have that great credibility. You know, you, I think of companies that I highly respect, like Yellow Games and Arcane Wonders. And so they decide to make a separate company just because we're producing this kind of game. And it's like, I don't know, it seems to get muddy, but I'm sure that they have their reasons. I just think there's already so many companies, so many games going on. It just kind of muddies up the water. Can know. you guys give me a sec? I've just missed my mouth and spilled my drink all over my notes. <laughs> You <laughs> You're used to watching Little Baby Batman, aren't you? I am. I am. Excuse me, Mo. <laughs> <laughs> and that is how live radio happens. <laughs> oh, oh, Barry, there's none like you, my I, friend. I can't tell which one's number one and which one's number ten now. Oh no. At least it wasn't all over your keyboard, right? Yeah, Ben, ben says that we need to get Badger some straws. <laughs> it could have been worse. Maybe I could have pissed myself. <laughs> maybe you need a bib, too. So one more thing on that. Um, I was talking to uh, the publisher of um, Immortal 8. I had them around my house. They were demoing the game for me so I can talk about it um <laughs> that's his name's manu from uh moonster games but he set up his company in i think he said it was the philippines he was originally in the philippines when he set up his company in Moonster games and uh because he's moved back to france he now has to have a different publishing name which i found very strange and so um when you look at immortal eight it's not just moonster games it's also sorry we are french so he has two companies and, but that's due to legal reasons that he has to have two different company names on the box. So, uh, yeah, that's why I said I'm sure they have business reasons why they do this, and and there's different ways to structure the different companies and their profits and loss yeah. and all those kind of things. So I get yeah. it. But. You get it. Well, that's the things that make us go hmm. So with that, let's move right on to the good. The not so bad and, and the sponsor the, break. Uh, 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 yeah, I see it right there. It's in highlighted it's in red. red. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're gonna go to the good, the not so bad, and ugly uh, in a few moments. But first, there's more. Our great sponsor, Arcane Wonders, has an amazing amount of different uh, games that are being offered to the consumers right now. And a lot of it has to do with their alliance with the Dice Tower Essentials. Dice Tower Essentials are games that you probably have heard about, but they are games that are recommended by Tom Vassell of the Dice Tower. And this is a collaboration between Arcane Wonders and the Dice Tower. And what they've done is they have collaborated to find games that they believe are really top-notch games that have this Dice Tower seal of approval, but then uh, bring them to the mass market. And they've had some fantastic success. One of their first games was Sheriff of Nottingham. It sold 165,000 copies. Uh, fantastic. Well, now you can see right here the new Merry Men expansion is out. And this allows you to play up to six players. It also incorporates the new laws. Uh, there's a lot more variability in the game. Fantastic upgrade. I've played this several times now, and we almost never play it without all the laws uh, that are in this because it just creates that extra level of, of complexity, if you will, or just that extra variability as well. Uh, so that's super cool. Also, the hit game, uh, abstract game, Onitama, has a new expansion called Sensei's Path. And this here adds another set of 15 cards. But what's really cool about these cards, it comes with its own, own little cute little box here with the magnetic flap, which is, is super neat. The artwork in Onitama is really cool. Uh, but the variability of these particular cards really takes Onitama to another level. So I love the fact that uh, these cards, because there's just different combinations there that are, that are, are much uh, it just adds that extra level of complexity, variability, and options, those kind of things. Also, the hit 
Dice Tower Essential game viral has been just jumping off the shelves. Uh, people are loving viral. There, Jamie Keggy just did a great big review about viral, and uh, this here has got a whole anatomy of the of the body, and it's an area control game that you're working through. So very fancy. And lastly, the hit game Spoils of War. And of course, I have an affinity for this one because I'm on the cover of the game. But uh, we love Spoils of War, and you can still get that great party game. Great, uh, it's it's Liar's Dice on steroids, man. You'll love it. So those are some of the games you can check out from our sponsor, Arcane Wonders, and uh, check them out. And they've got some really cool stuff coming out that we're going to be talking about in the future. And so with that, now we'll go on to the good the not so bad, and the ugly. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to write a message to Kabuki, but um, I was just wondering why she hasn't got around to playing her, her Dice Tower Essential games. I was thinking maybe... Yeah, what's she, up with that? What? She, she's Jesse's here and he loves that game. A, locked in a car somewhere in the car boot, but... Um, Yes. And James Brazil is in the house and he loves Dice Tower Essentials and Kabuki Kid. Uh, she loved, loved, oh, yeah, she won a group of Arcane Wonders games on the Robert Oren show, I think. Oh. I'm sure they're coming. Okay, good. Bad. All right, let her rip, buddy. That's not the one. <laughs> Oh, good. 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 Oh, and no another baby will ever do. <laughs> so tell us about the good, the not so bad, and the ugly. Okay, the good, the not so bad, and the ugly is our first impression segment where we will tell you about um, a game that we played for the very first time. And we do this in a kind of uh, game show style. We describe the game loosely for the for you, the viewers, and then you, very the loosely, podcast listeners, and also the other person on the other side of this camera. Okay, yes, and so we try to make a game out of it, and so they try and guess what this game is, and then they try and guess if we like this game or not, and we give it that rating of either the game is good, we're going to come back and play it again because we really enjoyed it. Not so bad is, you know, a game that you wouldn't mind playing or you don't mind it too much. You know, if, if someone asked you to play it, you play it. And then the ugly, which is pretty self-evident, I think. Don't you? Yeah, absolutely. So do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? Um, I am ready. I want to go first. No, you go you, first. You go. I want to go first. Go first. Then. No, you go first. Go first. Okay, you go first. I'm going to punch go him. <laughs> I'll go first. So, <laughs> uh, the game that uh, I have selected I'm listening. is an award nominated game. Oh, I need to switch up the chat as well. So, I can't see what you guys are talking about. So, I can. Yeah. Uh, this game, uh, I would consider a family to medium weight game. Mm -hmm. uh, the game has a fair amount of variability, modular tiles. It has some exploration. It's a deck builder. Ooh. It came out in 2017. Mm-hmm. It's an interesting deck building mechanism. This is going to be a good clue where you only have four cards at a time. Hmm. Sounds. I'm thinking Clank in Space. No. James in the chat has a, has a partially correct answer. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you don't look. You don't know. No, I don't know. Um, keep going. You're 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 running through the brush. 
Okay. What, the basil brush? Boom, yeah. boom! <laughs> um, I, I've got something that'll help you. No, no, no. No, no, don't get... No, 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 no. Don't drop your trousers. No, not on live telly. Oh, oh, you poor... You lucky podcast listeners. You don't get... Oh, put it away. Oh. Okay, I'm going to give you some... Uh, now, this 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 here was me at a, in a younger younger day. Okay, yes, yes. Uh, you know what? I've just remembered. You wrote this game down in the show notes, you nonce. You're not supposed to do that. How many times? Well, have why did you this? look at the show notes? You're not supposed to look at the show notes. How do I know what to say if I don't look at the show notes? We're, we're going to have fisticuffs. I just did that this morning for myself. Why didn't you write it down on a piece of paper and then spill some drink on it? I don't want to write nothing now, okay? You want to have some fisticuffs? Well, carve it into your table game topper thingy. Oh. Uh, yeah, <sighs> it's, very... it's El Dorado, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> It's Quest for El Dorado. You're correct. Yes. Yeah, okay, I'll tell you a little bit about. I'll tell you a little bit about Quest for El Dorado. So you know my list. That ah. Don't God. write the script. Oh well. It, uh, ah. You better not have written your top ten down on the list because I want it to be a surprise. Yeah, don't look at it. <laughs> You've you don't written. have to look at it. You've written it, haven't you? I'm looking down at the computer. I should be looking up here, but I gotta tell you, Barry, don't look at it. Did I write my okay. list? Okay. Oh, yeah, on. I don't want to hear it. Okay, I don't want to hear it. So, <laughs> so basically, what you're doing in Quest for El Dorado, it's a deck builder. You've got these cards. You're traveling along this journey. There's several different scenarios. There are modular tiles that can be put. Um, in between each of these tiles, there are barriers that you need to cross. The barriers are actually tiebreakers. Uh, everybody in, in the party is going to find El Dorado, basically. And you, you're going to get uh, uh, cards that allow you to go through the green hexes, which are brush, or you're going to be able to go through tiles that are like desert or gold that you need money, basically, to get through that caravan. Uh, or you're going to go through water spaces, and there you need a sailor or a captain, you know, that kind of thing. But then there's other cards that some cards allow you to do some culling or some cards, which I've never seen this before, but they're it's like they're you have to pay quite a bit for the card, but then it's only a one-time use. There's a few like, like that. Maybe you, yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, and then you're everybody's fighting to get the quest of El, El Dorado. So there's this race mechanism that's going on in it. So with all of that, again, brief overview. What do you think I think about Quest for El Dorado? I believe it was a Spiel de Jaris nominee. Mm -hmm. Well, I love it, as I've already reviewed it on the show already. And I think that you love it. I think that you think this game is good because it is it is very light, easy to understand, and it's a great challenge. And, you know, you think that's you're losing, and all of a sudden you'll just have a handful of cards, and you go bang, 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 and you've caught up with everyone. And all of a sudden you're in front of everyone because they forgot to buy this type of card, and so they're now trying to buy that type of card to, to, to catch up with you. Um, so I think that you think this game is good. Yeah, Ben thinks I love it. I don't know what everyone else is thinking, but here we go. It's good. Yay. We have a screenshot of dun, dun. Um, Scythe. It and is the Scythe. And the leaders are talking to each other. Yeah, he says, so do you hear we're going to be on the Berkey and Badger board game Babble show? Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> and then the wolf says, do I have to go? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's good. You know, the first time we played it, uh, we liked it right away. Uh, we had one little rule wrong, but it was it was a minor thing. Uh, but then uh, we immediately wanted to play it again, and mm -hmm. we played it again. Uh, this was over New Year's Eve, and then, sure enough, a uh, couple Tuesdays ago on game night, I brought it out. We played it. Everybody loved it, and a whole whole new group of people. And uh, what did we do? Play it again. Let's do it again. Mm. Yeah, and let's add add all the stuff. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of variability. I think I think this game is poised for an expansion because uh, there's so much you can do with those different quests, different cards. Um, 
for, for the weight that it is, it's very accessible. It's easy to teach, um, easy to get the table. It plays in about an hour. All of those things that make make that game accessible, a great gateway game. And yet there's a lot of choices. There's a lot of, especially yeah. with the variability, you get you get to do a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. It, um, is it is it produced by in the same kind of crappy version as the Ravensburger we have over here in Europe? Um, it is produced. Yeah, it's Ravensburger. Oh, right. So it's, yeah, okay. That's the yeah. Answer. You know the production. The production quality is okay. Is it just me, or is Berkey turned into R2D2? We might lose Berkey for a bit. Someone type me a message, say, Berkey sounds like R2D2. Oh, we've lost him. I think we've lost him. Oh, have we? This is interesting live TV. R2D2, thank you, James. Like he's 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 in he's in the jungle somewhere. Smaller. Excuse us for this interruption. Um, maybe I should play some music. <laughs> He's not a robot. Robots are not that cuddly, I don't think. Uh, Come on, Ben. I think you need to back it. You need to sign off and sign back in again. I think. I think his internet's gone down, or his computer's gone pee pee, or he spilt drink on his computer. Computer. So uh, it's good. Bear with us a moment. I'm just going to send him a message on Facebook because he needs to be told um, what to do because he, he's, he's an elderly gentleman and sometimes he doesn't know what button to push and when to push it. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Then again, you might have lost me. You haven't lost me. No, because you wouldn't have responded with the R2-D2 moment. Berkey has hey. joined. There you are. I'm back. I was just about so to give you a message. Back? Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. Well, I'm, I'm sure living in the country, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was those reindeers that have taken over. They were trying to hijack the show. Yeah. Stinking reindeer. <laughs> Little scummy elves. Oh, dear. Get your damn stinky paws off me, Berkey there. <laughs> yep, that's the greatest Christmas movie ever, right? Um, okay, yeah, if you say so. <laughs> okay, my chat is still disconnected for some reason. Okay, we're back. You're back. Woohoo! All right, was it a moose or a squirrel? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's that's what happens when we're live. So tell us a little bit about the game that you are uh, have been playing. Okay, this game that I've been playing plays from two to five players, and we'll see you having um, yourself sail the seas with some modular tiles and you'll be exploring lands and sending your ships out to find resources and once you found a resource you'll need to spend cards to to do things basically this is a card game with a map where you're going to be placing out boats and you're going to be placing out pioneers who are going to be recuperating resources eventually during the course of the game you're going to be spending a market card to sell one of the resources that you have, which will increase the market price. This is important for the end of the game due to the fact that what will happen at the end of the game when someone's placed out all 10 of their pioneers, the game will end. And what you'll do is you'll count up your resources, how many you have of each, and you'll multiply it by the market value that it is now at. And that's how you play this game. It's very, very simple. It's very, very quick playing. As I said, you're going to be exploring uh, islands and looking for gold. And you're going to be looking for other resources like spice and black chocolate looking wood and other bits and pieces. Hmm. Wow. I don't know what it is. Yeah, that's good. Or maybe I spoke too fast. I got too excited, maybe. Maybe I <laughs> love this game, and yeah, 
maybe I spoke too much. So it has a it has a market element. Um, yes. I mean, it, it's not Century Spice Road. <clears throat> no, because there's boats. No, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's not Old Spice. It's all spice. No, 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 no. It's not all spice. It's Old Spice? No, it's not Old Spice. And it's not all spice. <laughs> I've got Old Spice on. Ah, oh, dearie me. <laughs> I, I don't I don't have a clue. What it what what is it? Uh, anyone on the forum? No, no, I did talk too much and too fast, and they've all switched off. They all go go and get coffee or tea or, or, or oh, Ben says it's spice and wood. Oh. Hmm. That's yeah. a great name for a game. <laughs> <laughs> well, the game that I'm talking about is a game called Elos from uh, La Boîte de Joux. There it is. Ah. Yes, it's a very, very small box, which has an amazing array of wonderful components inside. I mean, these the, the wooden components in it are so small, but so precisely cut, you're worried that you're going to break them. And hmm. this image is no longer available. Thank you, Board Game Geek. You're such a good... I'm having troubles with Board Game Geek lately. But anywho, yes, it's a uh, a very quick, you know, exploration game. Takes around about 20 to, to 40 minutes with a five-player game just to explore everything, to, to, to mine all the resources um, and adjust the market. So it works in your favor. Yeah, I like those kind of market games where there's actually a a uh economic track or whatever you want to use there and then you're able to uh be able to uh manipulate other people's stock in it if you will you know because mm. it affects all that yeah so what do you think i think about this game well it sounds like you like it i'm gonna say good Ooh, you think i like it hmm well there's actually some pictures. there's some pictures see i managed to get the pictures up Eventually, Board Game Geek, as I said, has been playing funny thingies with yeah, me today. Board, Board Game Geek is actually doing a huge beta test right now and are actually going to improve the overall look of all the site and the images. And uh, they're, they've already made some changes to the pages, and now they're working on, on this overall upgrade, which will yeah. really be great if they make that a little more user-friendly. Yeah, you, you get used to it. Yeah. But, um... Yeah, I found the game not so bad. Oh, not so bad. Oh, and there, there's old Gruber, and he says the the old wolf says I'm not so comfortable here. He says it's fine. It's gonna be fine. Don't <laughs> worry. It's fine. Yeah, it's not so <laughs> bad. Um, it's it's kind of lighter than I'd I'd like it to be. Uh, and again, I have. I don't think I've played it with the right people. Um, hmm. That I think that's a, that's a major thing, especially with playing games. Games are so independent on the people that are playing them. You could have a really crap game, but if you play it with the right group of people, it can turn into a great, you know, yeah. um, event. Um, and how many how many players does it play? It plays up to five. And, yeah, it um, seems like those games that have a have a market or have a stock track or something like that. It seems like they play a little better when you have more players. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's a very nice light system of as I said, using cards. You you basically all the cards have actions on them, but to use that action, you have to throw you have to discard X amount of cards to do that. And then you can be nasty and you can take over pirate zones, which will make the cost of things a bit more expensive for other players in certain areas of the map. Um, the, the game is just really light, quick playing fun. Um, but as I said, if I play it with the right group of people, um, I think it, it will pop a bit more. Um, mm. it's very, very, very well put together little box of components. There's a lot of components in there and they are stellar quality. Um, but, um, as I said, I, I liked it, uh, but it's not a great game at the moment. Maybe, as I said, maybe play a four or five player game and it will pop. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, that there again, those are our first impressions, this segment. And, you know, it's not like we've played them tons. I've played Quest for Eldorado, I think five times, but 
you know, generally we're only playing it a little bit. And you, it plays differently, just like you say, player count, a player group, and that those experiences all factor into it. I, I hear you. Yeah. Well, in, in light of what we're going to cover on this show, we've got a lot of ground uh, to make up. And I just got to say this. We have a special guest lined up for our next show in a couple weeks. We're planning on doing it on the 30th if everybody's schedule uh, works out. But uh, in light of all the things we're going to cover, we're going to be covering the hit game Scythe in our Knights of Babylon. And we've got quite a bit to talk about in our top 10 games of 2017. So I think we're going to move right along and go right into our Knights of Babylon. Take us away, Gandalf. Oh, dear me. Or Merlin. Should I put the music on or not? <laughs> I'm debating whether to stick music on or not. Yes, oh, yeah. Yep. There it is. Welcome, welcome to the kingdom of Babylon. In the castle of Babylon sits Berkey and Battle. And they will be looking at a game that they have both played. And they will be seeing whether or not it is worthy of entering the Kingdom of Babylon. They will combine their scores, and if it reaches a 10, they have a special place at the table in the Kingdom of Babylon. I was lucky I put the music on because otherwise there wouldn't have been the narration and I'd have had to do it live. That's exactly right, sir. <laughs> well, basically what we're going to do in the Knights of Babylon, we're actually going to do a little bit more of a tag team uh, description of how the game actually works. I will give you a basic overview, tell you some of the key points that we see in it, things that we like, things we may not like, that type of thing. Uh, this game is the game Scythe. Scythe uh, is designed and developed by uh, Jamie Stegmeier of Stonemeyer Games. And Scythe, obviously, this was, I believe, this initially was a Kickstarter project that was incredibly successful. Uh, I picked up one of the big packages uh, from this right away. It's had a couple expansions. It has the near and far expansion. It recently just has the new wind gambit expansion right back there. And so there's uh, there's been a lot of things going on with this game. One of the things that I think is very unique about this particular game that I've not really seen before is that the artwork of the game actually inspired the game. Uh, that was really a, a, an interesting thing. It was Jacob Rabinski, I believe, uh, might be pronouncing that wrong, from Poland. And he, he, you know, this artwork on this box is just like crazy. You've got these big old battle mechs that are in the background of this, you know, 18, 1900 era feel. Uh, it's just so invocative. I mean, you just want to sit and watch it, right? And just look at the artwork, uh, which I think is really something. And then for a game to be designed around that art universe was really something. 1920s Kabuki Kid says. Yeah, it was really, really remarkable. Basically, I'll, I'll give a little bit of the start of how the game's played, and then, Barry, you can kind of chime in with me. Yeah, don't forget to tag me. Tag you? Yeah. Tag you. All right. We need a button or something, right? Yeah, yeah, we do. We get one installed somewhere. Well, I'll basically what you're doing in Scythe, you know, Scythe has a an area control uh, aspect to the game. And when you look at the game, you think that it's a really heavy battle game, but it's really much more of a Euro game. Uh, where you're collecting resources. You've got battle mechs and, you know, you're getting these mechs out on the board that will allow you to do different things. But in order to get them, you have to collect resources. And you're collecting, you know, bags of wheat or you're collecting iron ore, you're collecting wood. Uh, you're also going to place workers out on the board. And when they control some of these uh, areas that have different resources, you're going to get those workers out there. What's really interesting about the 
game mechanism is that you each have these player boards. And you're going to move things from the top of your board to the bottom um, so that you actually open up spaces. For instance, say that the produce, like uh, on the board I played with the other night, on uh, uh, each one of these boards is different. So there's an amazing amount of variability that happens in the game. But on the produce side, for instance, if I produced and I, I was producing a worker, I'm going to take that worker off the top of that board and place it on the territory. And then underneath that spot where I took out the worker, there may be an associated cost for the next time that I produce. So that's really interesting and it requires a lot of thought. Then you have a secondary action on the bottom of the board. And if you have the resources available, you can activate that, uh, that ability. In, in the case that I was to example, um, when I produced, I could, I could take off of that top my workers. And then on the bottom was actually an upgrade so that I could actually take one of my uh, pieces on the top and move it down to below, which in that case would uh, cause me to be able to pr produce in three territories instead of two. So that's a basic uh, overview of, of the game mechanism. It's very basic. You can continue on that, Barry. Yeah, it's a it's an objective game where you uh, all the players have been set out objectives. Okay, you'll have six objective stars, but you will. I think there's ten different objectives that you can accomplish during the course of the game. Um, you'll be trying to either deploy all four of your mechs, which will mean that you complete an objective, which means you get rid of your star. You'll have a secret mission, which you can complete. You'll have, uh, you can either fill up the uh, track of popularity or the track of military might, and they will give you uh, an objective. And you can also fight. It's not all about producing stuff. There is a combat element in the game. And the, the game doesn't encourage you too much to do the combat. And again, there's not normally a lot of combat in the game. You may get into a, a few little scuffles during the course of the game because it will cost you dearly. It will, you'll lose your military might and you'll also lose your popularity. And popularity is very important because at the end of the game, which is triggered when someone gets rid of all six of their stars, you do your final scoring. And the more popularity you have, the more points you're going to get. There's a point multiplier in three parts, depending on where you are on the popularity track. So if you're at the top, you're going to get the maximum points for the zones that you control, for all the other bits and pieces, um, which can win you the game quite easily. Yeah, and I agree with uh, Ben. He says that, uh, that it encourages you to avoid combat and popularity is is very important. Kabuki Kid says that combat isn't as big a thing. And that's what's interesting, because when you look at the game, I mean, these miniatures are amazing. I mean, this here is the, the miniatures for the blue faction. This here is the miniature. He's This guy's sitting on a big old yak. I mean, yakety yak yak. Don't go back. Um, don't go back. I mean, these things, I really got to get them painted, I think. Uh, uh, the leader ability is something very interesting because there's a little bit of a race because there's these tokens on these different territories and everybody is wanting to go there because you're going to get this card. And on this card, there are three options. There's one option that might be kind of like you're going to get a couple resources just for because you got to that place with your leader and you're going to get it. So that's fun. You've got another option that maybe you're going to pay a couple bucks to get something maybe just a little better. So instead of it just being totally free, you got a little bit of cost. And then there's this uh, situation where there's kind of like you're the king jerk of the game. And so um, I, it's very interesting. And that this it doesn't pay to be a jerk, okay? Will Wheaton says that a different way. I'll just say it. It doesn't pay to be a jerk, okay? So what happens is I get to my spot. I get the little card. And what do I do? It's got these uh, different things, you know, get a couple wood, you know, uh, pay, pay two bucks and – and get a uh, 
uh, uh, an iron ore and something. And, and then it says, the children have built a tree house, but it's in the way of your mech. What do you do? Tear down the tree house and collect four wood. There was that there's a problem. In order to tear down the playhouse, you tick off all the kids. So what happens? You lose two popularity. Well, Berkey made a choice to tear down the treehouse. Because I really <laughs> wanted those four go those <laughs> the four wood. Yeah. So I lose my popularity. Did you have any sheep to, then? I have no sheep. Um, then it goes all the way down to zero, my popularity. Well, what I find out is I because I had produced two workers, now my cost to produce is popularity and one of my uh, uh, power tokens, power abilities on the side. Uh, so what do they call those again on the on the track? Yeah, the I think power it's track. The power track. Power. Yeah. yeah, military power track. So... Here I did is, is I was a jerk, tore down the treehouse, got a bunch of wood, but I couldn't produce on anything until I improved my popularity. So that was, uh, don't be a jerk. Just don't be a jerk. Don't tear down kids' playhouses. It's not nice. Yeah. The game is very asymmetrical. Each player will take on a different faction, which will start in a particular place on the board. Um, as Berkey said, you you collect two boards. You'll have your faction board, and then you'll have your action board, and you'll take these at random. And so, everyone will have a different action board, and all the actions are in different orders. So you will have maybe your movement at the top, but at the bottom you can construct X. Or on another board, it'd be you'll have your movement at the top, and maybe you'll be able to build a building. So everyone will have different boards and everyone has different powers. Some powers will allow you to go across water pretty quickly. Um, so you can expand very, very quickly. One of the powers is a military power, which will kind of convince you to be a bit nasty and do the attacking. Again, you're going to get a, you know, you're going to achieve an objective when you, when you do a combat and you win that combat. So um, it, there, there is these, these little, little, things there to tease you to do them and it's up to you whether you do them or not um the game is uh, a very deep and thinky game um because you've got so many possibilities and there's so many different things that you can do and it all again depends on the interaction of the other players how they act what they go in for it's a big big puzzle and uh, a lot of people have their their strategies and their their own ways of playing and winning, and that's something that I am not too keen on about the game. Um, it is a game where you need to learn um, the, the the path to victory because, yeah. it, as I said, it's complicated. You you screwed yourself over. Again, first game I ever played, I screwed myself over by not having any popularity. Popularity is important, um, and it's not until you learn that lesson that you that's when the game becomes interesting for you. And then you have to think about all the other ways of doing it. How do you interact your power with your movement board and with your movement board to where you are situated on, on the map and what's going on around you? It's, it is a well, puzzle. You have this. You have this kind of end game timer, if you will. You know, in other words, you're getting those six stars up there, mm -hmm. and whoever does that first, and that that's a kind of a trademark of Stonemaier games. You see that that type of mechanism in the in Euphoria, which is one of my favorite games. Uh, Viticulture, likewise, love Viticulture, great game, Tuscany expansion. Um, so, so it's a great thing. But it also creates if if you don't if you mess up at the beginning of the game like that like James he says says that it took him three rounds the first time you know to get that right because it wasn't able and just like me you know <laughs> my life has changed so much with with the Game Topper company and and everything that I've been doing that I haven't I'm not getting in the gameplay that I used to I mean it's probably been seven or eight months since I played Scythe. Well, we got the near and far expansion. We right away we played that, and th that near and far expansion. It has this faction here, and I think it's called. Uh, 
well, it's Akito and and uh, Yuri. I forget is it the Toko, Tokugawa clan. Uh, there's also another uh, another faction, uh, and they give different abilities where they can either put flags out on the board or they can uh, put traps out, which is just kind of interesting from variability. And then you can play more players. You can go up to seven players. Um, and that was from the Invaders from Afar. Thank you, Invaders from Afar. And then now they have another expansion that's called the Wind Gamut. The Wind Gamut was really interesting, really pretty simple. Um, you can see that miniature there. Uh, they're fantastic. I got my uh, sample, my miniatures actually, my uh, Wind Gamut from Meeple Source. They're one of the retailers for Stonemeyer. And basically what the Wind Gamut does it can give all of the airships uh, one ability, or it can give each of the airships a different ability. And you have an offensive and a defense type of ability. Uh, very interesting. Uh, they're Again, they're not like overpowering battle, typical battle mindset. I mean, they just give you different abilities and, and mine allowed me to move and challenge other airships. Uh, so it really adds a, just another layer. And these player boards, you can see here, this is one of the things I love about this game, and, and I think Stonemeyer in particular. But the component quality is always top-notch. You know, Jamie developed the treasure chests that have all these amazing little uh, resin tokens for wood and for gold and i mean if you haven't seen the treasure chest i love these i bought these right away i supported the second kickstarter i mean i love these things i use them for all my games i've bought more of them so i can just keep them in some of my favorite games <laughs> i love tricking out the game well anyway these here have cutouts little cutouts in the cardboard so it's double layered i don't know if you can see that very well but this allows you to keep all of your pieces and they don't fall all over the place um, and each one of these boards is different, and these get randomized. So the variability of this is really quite amazing. Yeah. So uh, I think there's we've also most of it all gone. Yeah, we didn't we the, we didn't really go through each of the different stars or achievements that you can win. Um, but you know, for just for instance, if you see my battle board here with the mechs. There's four mechs. So if you get all four mechs on the board, on the uh, onto the board, you're going to uh, get one of those star achievements. But each one of them is going to give you a different ability. So your engine, if you will, is going to grow. So and likewise with all the other abilities, there there are benefits that that play out just like that. Yeah. So I think we've probably explained enough about the game where we can rate it and then kind of give our pros and cons, if you will. Mm -hmm. So Barry, what do you think about Scythe? We probably should talk about our ratings first. Let me just do that real quick. We have a five-point rating system, and then we have a combined score. And the, the, the five-point rating system... A five means that we absolutely love it. You must own it and we'll play it whenever possible. A four means it's very good. We want it in the collection. We love to play it numerous times, just not a five. Three means it's a good game. We'll play occasionally, but not a must have. Number two, there's some problems with it. Uh, not excited to play it again, wouldn't own it. And a one means we hate it, throw it off the roof, trash it, burn it. Whatever you got to do, just get rid of it. Dump it in the moat. Dump it in the moat. That's the number one. Yeah. So that's our five-point rating scale. So, Barry, what do you rate Scythe? Well, <clears throat> Scythe for me is in between a four and a three. So I'm going to go with three mainly. It is a good game, and I will play it occasionally, but it's not a must-have. It's not going to be a game for everybody. Um, it, there is a lot of really nice ideas included and mashed together that make for an interesting game. But as I said, it's more of a puzzle. Once you look at your boards, it's, it's, it's figuring out the best combination of actions to do each turn, which is going to lance you in front of everybody else. And 
for new players, for people that are not into playing that and want to play the theme of the game, the game is not going to roll well with them. Um, I'm one of those players that play with, for the theme. I don't actually play for the mechanics to win the game, unless it's a game which is just mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, unfortunately, the game just feels a bit random in places. I, again, I play with players that are, you know, the big game experts, and they slaughter me every time. Um, the game doesn't scale well. Two players is no fun at all. Whereas three to four is better and five is great, but it takes you a long time to play. So did you have you played it in the uh, the solo automaton version? Uh, the first time I got the game, yes, I played the solo automaton version and it helped me learn the rules. That's a, that's a one amazing benefit about the game. Um, but I just didn't feel that it was it was it was it was more of a, a race. It felt more of a race than a, an actual game. You, you, as I said, you really need to get into the the puzzle aspect of you know, this action is going to give me plus than this action there. Even though I want to do this action because I need to get that guy there into that space. So um, it's it it was good, but it wasn't great because you're playing against a deck of cards. Um, but um, oh, yeah, the the automaton was not too bad. But as I said, for learning purposes perfect yeah yeah so what about you how do you rate it to say a three well i struggled with this one um because you know me i like most games i'm not i it's very seldom that i'm going to find a game that i hate hate uh mm -hmm. there's lots of meh games that i don't care to own and and i don't mind saying if i they didn't thrill me um i think on the positive side is out because i'm struggling right now uh, even as I thought about this, as I was going through all of it, you know, where do I really rate this? Is it a five? Do I absolutely love it? Must own. We'll play it whenever possible. Or is it just very good? I want it. And I'll, I'll play, love to play it numerous times. It's just not a five. And when I started thinking about it, I, I do see some negatives, but I can't say it's not a five, that it's just not a five. Um, because I really do love the game. I love the puzzle of the game. Um, the thing that that impresses me, there's a few things I don't like. It, it, one thing is, it's not an inexpensive game, okay? Um, I love it. I, I, you know, I, I was happy to buy it. Um, it's worth every nickel, in my opinion. So I'm yeah. not saying that it's not worth it. I'm saying that it's an expense, more expensive game. Um, and then you buy the expansions. You know, I got the Meeple Reality insert for it. Um, and I love tricking out my games. And so I got all the fun stuff. I got the extra board, which turns makes it like another 25% bigger, the whole playing experience. Uh, the artwork, ah, I mean, we sat and talked about it while we were playing. Like, well, we want a picture on the wall just of this art. I mean, it's that fantastic. There was an art book on the Kickstarter. I didn't actually get the art book, but um, it's fantastic. And I love the experience of quality components. I mean, that's, that's you know, part of why I did Game Toppers. I love the experience of playing things in, in that environment. I love all the little tokens. I love the mechs. I love each board is different. I love that. I mean, that that that's a six. I mean, I love it about this game. <laughs> Uh, I like the puzzle. I agree with you and James and what other people have said that, you know, if <laughs> that first play, if you don't kind of get that mechanism down so that you can, yeah, it sucks when you can't combo and use both spots. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you do something wrong where you did it in the wrong order and you haven't gotten that down yet, that that's a, it, it's kind of like blood rage is, is my favorite game of all time. You guys know that. Um, uh, you know, that first play with new players, if they don't yeah. get that draft, they can really be hindered in that game. You know, they can kind of catch up. But nonetheless, I think that's a negative. Does that mean I don't love the game? No. <laughs> I, you know, I love the game. And I think that's just, it's one of these games I think you want to play more often. Um, I don't play solo games often, and I really want to try this solo. Yeah, give it a go. Yeah, so and and I saw the automaton rules with the wind gambit, and it was like, my goodness, 
there's just so much variability in this game. You can play this and never – we could have the same factions and not play the same game. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it, it's fantastic like that. So um, I think Jamie did a great job. The production value is off the hook. It's The game is thoughtful. Uh, wherever you go, you're always seeing this game played. Um, it's ranked really high on BGG, and I think it deserves it. So mm -hmm. I'm saying five. So you're saying a three, but I, I got a feeling that – you to you, it's a high three. It almost yeah. could have been a four. Yeah, Kabuki Kid is a three point five as well. <laughs> um, ben is a five, and James is a four. So they're pretty all good scores. Yeah, in, in, I mean, yeah. As I said, the game for me just I don't know. Maybe I've still not got into the the game properly and and seen the game as it is. I still see it as. You know, I am responsible for a faction. I'm going to send these guys out to do some farming and do some stuff and then build some stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just playing the theme when I play the game. I'm not playing to win. And I'm, as I said, I'm always playing against people that are playing to win. And they kind of, uh, not monopolize, but they they, ut they utilize their their brains, their, their playing brains to, to, to get the best out of every action that they do. And so I, I get whitewashed. Uh, every time um it, it kind of kind of d diffuses the fun of the game for me but um it, it's again it's still a learning curve i've played it about five or six times now um i still got it on my shelf uh, as i said it's not a game that i'm going to get rid of the production quality is phenomenal jamie's done um a great thing with the recess boards that's something that i've always wanted in every game is a recess board so your components don't move your tokens don't move perfect you take um, a game like terraforming mars that is a fantastic game but the you know the component quality honestly just isn't to the same level that this is if they would have put that kind of treatment on terraforming mars that jamie has put on stone on on scythe <laughs> that would yeah. be remarkable right again he thought about the insert he didn't put an insert in but he made it so you can store the game properly every time he, he, he on the 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 cover on the cover of the base it's got how you layer everything and that's brilliant that works really well so putting it away is simple there are a lot of components there's a lot of artwork there's a lot of little nuances in the game it's not just a resource gathering game that as i said there is the combat there is the negotiation there's the storytelling with the event cards that you were saying where you have three choices you'd be good bad or, or not so ugly um <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> there's so many things to do. It's a big puzzle of a game, working out where you're going to move your characters. And again, we haven't mentioned the factory in the middle of the board. Oh, yeah, yeah. Players can send their leaders to to draw a card and then they can add that card as an action, which will get this game is just so versatile and different each time you play, even though you're doing the same things. And um, I, I, and the com and the combat system, you know, we didn't really go through that, but you okay. know, you're able to take your military power, and you're able to have a variety of these different cards. But uh, and and so the combat system is fairly simple, but you're not relying on it. It's not the main part of the game, and so you've got this balance between when do you use that military power. Mm -hmm. um, so I just think there's it, there's so much going on it, and obviously, I mean, we're giving it a quite good score it's a score of an eight we have not yet put anybody in the knights of babylon as a 10 yet uh mm. we're working on it but uh oh, we, we work have on a, it, we? It's, <laughs> they have to pay us enough to, so, <laughs> to yeah just that's play. it you know jamie <laughs> we we would be happy to give this a 10 if uh you know just a couple more treasure chest boxes or something oh, <laughs> No, it's, you know, uh, you know, this is not a paid review, obviously, but we both own the game. Um, I think an eight is pretty high. What does it say about our rating system, our combined rating? Just look at it. I can't find it. <laughs> Why has it not been printed up on there? Oh, well, I took it. I took it off of mine because I wanted it on two pages. Oh, no. So you took it off of yours. So it takes it off of mine as well. Thank you, Berkey. Oh crap. Oh crap. He said. Well, don't use that as your template for next time. <laughs>
Sherry Google Docs, what a joy. Uh, if Berkey played Seventh Continent, I believe it would be a 10. There you go. Oh. I'd like to if we had a group that I could get together and go through a campaign. So I, think, I, I think it's the same thing with uh, with the Gloomhaven. Yeah. All right. So anyway, it's an eight, and I believe that brings it into the courts of Babylon. Not mm -hmm. around the round table, but it brings it into the courts. So really high score. Congratulations to Jamie Stegmeyer, Stonemeyer Games, and Alan Stone putting together a great production. I know a lot of people love Scythe, and uh, I likewise do. And I'm looking forward to playing it again. We're going to get together here while it's all fresh in our mind, and we're going to play that again, and we're going to get all those expansions out, and it's just great fun. So with that, we're going to move on to our bab 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 babble topic. And now it's time for the babble 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 and badgers for game babble. Hey hey hey! The babble 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 talk it. So tell talk 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 it. So tell me, Barry, what do you think about? 2017 and gaming. Okay, right. Let's try this. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Jean Pierre. I am the mayor of Babylon, and I have been recently elected by the king, Mr. Berkey himself, to be <laughs> the presenter of the Babel topic because it is me that is in touch with. All the people in Babylon, and I listen to all the things they say about board gamings because Babylon is a kingdom for nobody apart from board gamers. Isn't that a wonderful <laughs> place to live? Come yes. live here. Come, come along and live with us. Anyway, I have been <laughs> listening to the people, and I hear lots of things like, Ugh, 2011 was a, a, a bad year for games because blah, 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 blah. And uh, also I hear uh, so many great games come out in 2015, which leads me to think, uh, should we really be judging a game from the year that it came out? And should we put the, 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 the date of the year of the game on the box as an important sign of this is the greatest game of 2002? Oh, this is the greatest game too. Should, should we push aside the age? Is age a problem in board gaming? If a game is 50 years old, does that make it a bad game? Hmm. Let's ask his majesty himself, Monsieur Berkey. Does Yes, air... of course, of course, we should look into this. Good thing. Is the year the important item that we should be talking about? <laughs> yes, yes, it's 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 an important thing. Yeah, no, I I think it's a good point. You know, there are so many games being produced every year now. I heard a report. I went in and started to look it up, and was unable when I was going through my top ten to find all the games that I've played, games that were highly rated. And I started going through there, and there were 98 pages on the Board Game Geek. Each page varied. I got through about 25 pages where it started getting some of the more obscure games. But it was like, I've heard like 3,400 games came out last year. Wow. Now, in 2016, I heard the estimate was like 1,500. Well, mm -hmm. if that if that is true... I don't know for sure if it is. I don't know if anybody in the in the chat knows exactly how many games were actually produced in 2017. But if it did do that, even if it just did the 1500 games, that's a crazy potload of games that have been then put out, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um again, when I looked through there was only 50 pages and I think there's like 100 games per page, so 50 times 100 no, that's that's not really sure. No. <laughs> that doesn't make sense whatsoever. Oh dear, Scott's going to phone me and tell me. Don't, yeah, it's. Uh, I, I just think that we we've talked about this topic about gamer glut before. That there's so many games coming out, but you know, does the year 
have anything to do with whether or not it's a good game? I don't think they does. I don't think. I think for some people, some people are yearist and they won't buy a game which is older than um, 2015, for example. Yeah. Um, because, you know, the, the thing about the, the hobby is there's always a game which is made and then someone takes that idea and turns it into something else. And then someone takes that idea and puts it in with something else and does that. And so there's always this like, well, basically this game is Catan, but it's not Catan because it's got all of this going on. Uh, which makes it a better game because it was only released last week. Yeah, so you're seeing really kind of this hybrid type of mentality, hybrid game mentality that they're getting better and better improving upon one another's mechanisms. I, I just watched the Dice Tower Board Game Breakfast show and uh, Tom's, uh, Tom, Tom's Think segment, well, he was talking about hipsters uh, in gaming, meaning they always have to have the newest, greatest, you know, trendy thing. So, you know, we, we it's the cult of the new. We always have yeah. to have this new game, right? And I can understand that, you know, but if I'm thinking about an old, old game, say that the game is 10 years old, eight years old, there's something about that that causes it sometimes to lose its luster. Yeah. Hmm. Not, not, not for some of the truly great games that I own, but some of them, you know, you know, like Castles of Burgundy, I love that game. I could care. I, I don't care what year it is. Yeah. You know, the, but there, there's other games that they've just kind of gotten old and other games have kind of replaced them. Yeah. The thing is, I don't, I don't think you're going to be able to buy an old game in a store because it's either very bad and obviously they don't sell it anymore and they haven't published it again. So it's always going to be an old game, which is still a classic. I mean, you'll still go into the store and you will see Catan and you will see Carcassonne and you will see Al uh, Alhambra because they're old and they're classics. Um, yeah. And, you know, th that's always nice because, I mean, in another five years' time, are we still going to find um azul in the stores are we still going to find dragon castle in the stores you know is el dorado still going to be around or is it going to be on its 15th printing with a decent box cover and decent components <laughs> right right well and and nostalgia has something to do with it you know i've been gaming yeah. since high school so you know my all of my big milton bradley box games shogun and conquest of the empire axis and allies I don't care that they're old. I realize that there are newer, better games or there are improvements, but the age doesn't have an effect. But there's some some that the luster is like, no, there's something better. We're always looking for something better. And yeah. I probably think think we think the newer, the better it is because it's advanced. But if you enjoy Pong, stick to Pong. <laughs> I mean, I'll buy a game because um, boxes don't come with the year printed on them, apart from if they've won a Spiel des Jahres. They'll have the Spiel des Jahres uh, logo saying, we you this won the prize, and it'll also say what year that it won the prize. And I don't look at the year. I just look at the, 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 the logo and I go, well, that won a prize. That must have been a very good game. I, I've heard some good things about it. I'm going to buy it. Yeah. So. The game doesn't, the, the, sorry, the year doesn't really matter to me. It's more of a case of, you know, the pleasure that I'm going to have from playing that game. And again, I am, you know, in that loop of, you know, these Kickstarters keep arriving at my door and I get to play every new game in the world. But I still like to play the good and old tested ones. And I don't think that, you know, the, the year does matter when this game come out, as long as it's still here and it still makes people laugh and it still makes people have fun. I think the thing that, that was interesting to me, and of course, you know, we're, we're minor internet superstars having our podcast like we have, you know. We're me, mina minor. We're, we're below minor, we're mina minor. Uh, no, we're minor. Don't, you know, you're diminishing now. So. <laughs> No, so, <laughs> you know, but uh, my point is, is, you know, when you're doing media content creation, you kind of want to be up on the latest stuff. Mm. And and I was listening to Robert Oren. I, I love Robert. 
and he has a YouTube channel. I'd really recommend anyone to listen to it. The, the man's just a fantastic guy. Uh, <laughs> but Robert uh, just talked on his vlog this last last Sunday, and what he had made a comment about was about he does. You know, he's not the greatest reviewer. He he. What he does is kind of interact with people on a on a really great personal leather and shares his life and paints miniatures, things like that. And, and it's just a wonderful community. I love it. Uh, but he said, I don't feel like I have to have that greatest, the new game so that I can grow my channel. And, and mm -hmm. there's a pressure with media people that, oh, we got to get the greatest thing oh, yeah. because that's one that everybody's interested in. And, and so we got we to jump the shark. The first one that prints the video, post, post the video up there is going to get more hits than everybody else. And there you go. That's it. That's all it's about. It's about hits. When, uh, But that, that's a subject for another subject, that is. That's a subject. Yeah, it, <laughs> yeah it is a, it is a, it is another topic. But I think, I think the pressure to play new games, that, that is in the hobby too because we're all looking for that next experience, that next yeah. better experience kind of, I, I know it's a little bit of a different topic, but I think the age of a game plays into that. And I found that when I was going through my list, <coughs> excuse me, I looked through that thing and I was surprised at how many games were rated really, really high in people's top 10 of the year. Uh, people like Dan King and people like Tom Vassell and and uh, I looked at several different ones. I forget them all now right now. But um, and then you look at the Board Game Geek ratings and what people are saying. And I'm looking at all these new games and going, oh my goodness, I've played 29 games uh, that were made in 2017. Most of them I've only played once. There's no way I could get to all of those games. And I'm realizing that I've missed some really good games that are out there that were produced in 2017. But maybe Tom and that have missed some really good games that you've played and they haven't played in 2017. That's, that's <coughs> well, the thing that's with it. that many games come out at once. It's, it's, there's no way you can play them all. There's no way you can judge them all equally as well. No, I hear people just raving about Azul and... You know, and, you know, I play Clans of Caledonia and, and Gentis and some of these games that are that that are out there that just came out at Essen, where a lot of us in the United States, we don't even get those games until the following year. We don't mm -hmm. we don't know what they're even talking about. Yeah. Uh, you know, so there's there's that. But I think that's a good segue to go into our top 10, because I think both of us struggled putting together, you know, I had 29 games that I could choose from, yeah. but I realized this does not mean that these are the best 10 games of the year. Yeah. These are for me anyway, the best 10 games I was able to play. Yeah. And so that's the perspective that I'm coming from. I, I have a definite opinion on why I ranked them the way I did and which ones I like. Uh, of those 29, but that's 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 where I'm at as far as the quantity I was able to review. How about you, Barry? Well, as you said, <clears throat> excuse me, as you said, most of my games that I played from 2017 were probably just one-time plays at events that I've been to. Um, and uh, uh, there are some games that I've played three or four times. And there's some games, well, there's one game in particular that I've played 23 times from two servers. I'm just looking at all the games that I've played. My wow. number one most played game of last year is Onitama. Oh. I played it 36 times. What year did that come out? I also played King and Assassins 14 times. What wow. year did that come out? And I've played Batman Gotham City Chronicles nine times. And that's not even out yet. <laughs> So, <laughs> wow! You can see how hard it is for us, us minor minor um, reviewers, to actually play every single game. But anyway, um, my my top ten list has some games that I've only played once, and I did like them. But I wouldn't necessarily put them in the top ten. It's just a case of they are in the top ten due to the fact that we need to fill up the top ten. Otherwise, it's not a top ten. 
<laughs> yeah, and I think that's kind of interesting. It's it's exciting though. It's uh, I think that's what what's so great about it is the fact <clears throat> that there are just so many great games coming out, and so mm -hmm. that's what that's what we get to deal with. Uh, yeah. And it's just finding that one for you. That's the that's the the thing. Well, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to each list off our 10. We're just going to give a, a brief explanation. We're going to keep it kind of short just for time. Otherwise, it'll take forever to get through this. Yeah. Uh, but we're, we're going to just give a brief explanation and say why we like it and rating it. We're going to start with our number 10. So, Barry, do you want to start out with your number 10? My number 10 is the one that we just spoke of in the uh, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly is Eos, which is a, a light kind of resource gathering merchant market game exploring game. Um, as you saw, very, very, very adorable. Nice, light, quick playing. And um, yeah, it's just adorable to look at as well. Yeah, it sounded like it was a good one. My number 10 is a big box game. And I actually have a stack of games here that I prepared for the ah. show. Gee. This game is the game Immortals. This game is a great big honking box from Queen Games. You can see the back there for those that are you watching it. And you can see the components YouTube. falling out everywhere as well. <laughs> yeah, it's probably not a good move. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, what's falling out is the cube tower. Ah, oh, Immortals yes. has um, this awesome cube tower, just like it has for their game Shogun or for Amerigo. I love that cube tower. What's interesting about Immortals, and I think they did a really great job, is that you have two sides of the map. And when do you go from one side, you go to the other. So you got the light side and then the dark side. And they interact differently, and it really messes with you because it's area control and uh, but I thought it was a really great production. Love the Cube Tower. Immortals, my number 10. Cool. Number yeah. nine. I'm going to ask everyone on the chat, what's your number one game of 2017? List it out, and I'll read it all out <clears throat> live on national television. This yeah. is the BBC. For the major internet podcast celebrities yes. like Barry Doublet. Doubly, yeah. My number nine is a game called Profiler from Cocktail Games. It's a mm. party style game where one player will have a personality and what they'll do is they will have this little bar chart which starts at zero and goes plus five and minus five. And they'll have two clues. And these clues are to a kind of person. So it might say um, something like, um, most likely to stand up when a football team scores a goal. And so you put it on this track either at zero, which means that it might be likely or negative if they won't stand up. And but the thing is, there's going to be five personalities out on the board and the other players have to guess which personality, personality it is and deduce by removing the names by the two clues and where you place them on this bar. Very, very much fun um, trying to, with all the different names like the Queen and Freddie Mercury or maybe, you know, um, a policeman. Um, very quick playing party game. Very much kind of like code names, but it's more team building as you're trying to get everything right uh, to get maximum points. That's Profiler. Profiler. Hmm. All right. Well, my number nine is a small game from Renegade Game Studios. And this is a two-player game. And I have very few two-player only games. I probably have a dozen or so. But um, this is the game called The Fox and the Forest. Mm. Um, it, it's, it's a really fun little card game that is basically a trick-taking game. But you're having points, and you're trying to get to 12 points, I believe. Or no, 20, 21 points. And you just have some great little cards. But if I remember right, there's only three suits. 
I think we reviewed this. I think I may have done this in a not so a good, bad, not so yes, ugly. Uh, but this, but um, you've got the bells and the moons, and then the keys, and they're all ranked up to thirteen, I believe. And so you're you're just going back and forth. Uh, you have some special abilities on a couple of the cards, but there's normal trick taking. Uh, but you can switch the trump. Uh, it's just super fun. My daughter Gabby and I have played this several times, and it's just really been a hoot. It's really cute little artwork. It's accessible. It's inexpensive. Uh, under 20 bucks, you can get this game. So my number nine, Fox and the Forest from Renegade Game Studios. Okay. My number so eight. Number eight. My number you eight. My, my favorite summer best voice. Uh, I'll, I'll put that on the podcast. I'll put in something really cool. I'll use the um, guy from the future. Anywho. Number eight is <laughs> a game that I just played recently once, and that is Okagana. Oka Okanagan. Okanagan. I don't know. Okanagan. Oh, okay. dear me. Oh. Do you know what I'm talking about, people? I don't. <laughs> oh, let me find it. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? It's. It's a game much like Carcassonne, where <clears throat> you're basically placing out a tile and building up a map. But on your turn, you're going to be um, placing out a, a little token. It'll either be a hut or a river or a sunny brother. And once a whole area has been fenced off because the tiles come in different kind of areas, you've got forest, you've got lake, you've got plain, you've got mountain. Once they're all complete... So you have like a complete wall, like in a castle in Carcassonne, you actually score the resources which is in there. And depending on what you've used on what tiles will determine how many of the resources you get to take. Um, it's very light, very easy to play, very interesting. It's, it's Carcassonne. Actually, it's more woolly bully than Carcassonne, um, where you're fencing off areas. Um, really adorable. And that is Okagunan. No. Oh, where is it? <clears throat> I spelled it right, but I can't spell it right. Okigawa. 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 Yeah, it might be different in uh, America. I've got Okigawa. Oh, well. Well, you know, one thing, I, I see a lot of information going on in the chat here, and they're talking about role player, you know, and I, I think I love role player, but it's 2016. Um, but the problem is a lot of these games we didn't get till 2017. Um, this was going to be, I'm, I'm, I'm going off script here just a little bit, uh, but regarding just this comment, because it's in the chat, I think it's really in like Great Western Trail, Terraforming Mars. Those are 2016 games, but a lot of us didn't get to play them till 2017 or we didn't receive them in the United States. This here is a game that I absolutely adore. Um, this game is called Port Royal. Mm -hmm. And this was actually a 2015 game, but it wasn't available to us in North America. Excuse me, Steve Jackson Games just came out with it. And so it's actually 2017 for us. It's fantastic. So I didn't put it in my list because I knew it wasn't an actual 2017 game, but... That's when I played it. It's when it was available. Uh, it's fantastic. Anyway, long and short of that. So, okay. uh, yeah, Okagannon Valley of my number. Lakes. That, that's what it was. Ok Okigawa. Oh, I'm reading the chat. You're okay, reading I G A. Oh yeah, you, that's a different one. Ok A N A G A N. Ok Agan. Ok Agan. There you go. That's probably not even out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like the game you did in the, the good, the not so bad and ugly. You had us all fooled because we haven't heard of it. Yeah, that's strange because Dan King's done a review of it. Mm hmm. He's the first. Really? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, or is it, I need or to is go it, back and watch it. Or is it one of the Dice Tower crew? Well, my number seven is a is a trick taking game, and it's by WizKids, and it's He's called. No, it's called Tournament at Camelot. Okay. You sure? Tournament. We should be on eight. We're on eight. No? This is designed by Ken Shannon, Karen Bogininski, 
Berkey, Berkey, <laughs> Berkey, Berkey time out. Time out. You haven't done number what? eight. You haven't done your number eight. It's written on your script. Ah, you wrote. Yeah. Oh, dear. Someone doing a, a, a face slap. Like that. What was it? I, I thought we were on seven. No, we're on eight. Okay. You haven't done okay. Eight. This is, this is a live podcast that we edit. <laughs> so do over. Number eight. My number eight is Vikings Gone Wild. Yay! There it is. Woohoo! This is by Lucky Duck Games. Uh, Vikings Gone Wild is a deck building game. Um, I find that Vikings Gone Wild is a little bit interesting compared to a lot of different games, uh, deck building games, in that you can attack one of your other players' tableaus, things that they're building up. Um, but you, if you've attacked them, they get a token on it, so everybody else can't attack them. I thought that was really neat. So you never felt like people were ganging up on you, but you had both, you know, you're collecting some resources, you're building your deck, and then you kind of have the race at the end. Um, I haven't played with the expansions yet. I have them. I haven't played with those yet, uh, but I really like the game. So my number eight is Vikings Gone Wild by Lucky Duck Games. Okay. My number seven is a game about trees. And no, it's not photosynthesis. It's... Ah, I was going to say that. No, it's Lab. Um, again, probably a game which is only out in French because it's a French title called Lab, which is tree. In the game, um, there's a tree in the center of the table, and players will have a bunch of components, which are branches, buds, flowers, leaves. And on your turn, you're going to be playing cards, which will allow you to place these branches and flowers and stuff on the tree obviously there's some certain rules which will prohibit you from doing certain things because you can't put one of your branches on another player's branch so these branches are colored and the object of the game is just to get rid of all the tokens in front of you it's enjoyable it's refreshing i've never i've never played a game where you have to get rid of everything you've got in front of you by playing cards and there are so many different combinations that you can do really really enjoyable look out for it it's called lab but it's probably going to be called wow. tree in, in English, but that's, that's a boring name. Huh. Wow. <laughs> haven't heard of that. All right. Yeah. My number seven is Vikings. Is Gone wow. <laughs> Tournament at Camelot by Ken Shannon, Karen Boganzinski, and Jody Barbara Essie. Um, I actually got this as a review copy uh, several uh, months back. Uh, they actually reached out to me, the designer, because they wanted us to dress up in costume and do this for board game theater. And I said, yeah, I just didn't have the time for it. But I said, I'd look at the game if they wanted me to. And and so they had sent it to me. What's really unique about this game is you have player abilities. You have your main character and then you have an apprentice. And that kind of helps you collect tricks. Uh, we played this at Dice Tower Con with Sam Healy, Robert Orn, and families and uh, Sam's wife and and we just had a blast playing this game uh, it's one of the better trick-taking games that I've ever played uh, it takes a little longer than most you know we played a good hour and a half which you wouldn't think you'd play that much on a game like that but tournament at Camelot Camelot from WizKid games my number seven. There you go. There's, You're number six. There's, there's my number seven, Liz Arb. For those of you who want to see what it looks like. Okay. Oh, L-A-R-B-R-E. It's L apostrophe. Hmm. Yeah, yes. and that's from... Yes, I knew that. Uh, yes, L apostrophe A. Yeah. Yes, okay. Okay, moving right along. My number six. Now, these are the games that I've played. Does, does your tree bite? <laughs> no, it just barks. <laughs> yes, yes, I knew that. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. My number my number six is a game that I've played quite a bit, and it's a game called Rising Five, which oh, is yeah. a co-op game where it's a mixture of worker placement and mastermind, where you're playing with an app and you're trying to decipher the rune codes with your kind of Guardians of the Galaxy heroes. Uh, moving them about fighting monsters and, as I said, moving these runes about to try and decipher which rune is in the right place. 
really really light really fun nice big brain burner plays in 30 minutes easily great for kids um annoying music on the app <laughs> <laughs> but that's my number six that's rising five from uh holy grail games mr jamie johnson there you go pay me mate i pay <laughs> <laughs> yeah in fact in the united states now rising five has been picked up by gray fox games and oh, yeah. I think that's going to have a ton of impact because Gray Fox does a fantastic job with their games. And I think that's going to make a big difference, uh, bringing it at least to the North American market. Yeah. Your number yeah, six. Yeah, people, people love it. Number six. This is a redo of a game, and it comes from Restoration Games. And this is a racing game called Downforce. Mm. Downforce. You see the back of the box here. Uh, what's really neat about Downforce is you're each going to get a color, but you're you're all going to be bidding for these, and you're going to bid with one of the cards that's in your hand. And in these cards, there's going to be several different uh, tracks of, you know, maybe the red car will move six, and, and the orange car would move four, and the blue card would move two or something like that. And you're going to bid with those values in, in those cards, uh, you sometimes can pay too much, but whatever you bid, you're going to go back at the end of the game that amount. So you're kind of waiting, you know, for that. Um, it's a really unique mechanism of how you play those cards. And then you don't have to, uh, it's not about you winning, your color winning. It's about betting over three different periods who you think is going to win. So it's kind of like an economic, you know, type of betting. I, in my opinion, it blows away camel up. I like camel up a lot, but it's like it, it has that type of thing. Uh, it's just a lot of fun. This was one of those games that we wanted to do over and over again. And, and it plays up to six players as well. And it's 30 to 45 minutes. And that's about right. It's, it's a 45 minute game. So downforce, a uh, really great game. Okay. My numbers, Never my number six. One. Yeah. Hmm. Sounds cool. Okay. Yeah. My number five is a game by La Boite de Joux. It's another Kickstarter. It's called Outlive, where it's a worker deplacement uh, game in a dystopian future after some kind of a attack of nuclearness has taken place. And you're moving your scouting parties around the surface to collect resources. And then there's another phase where you're using those resources to keep your survivors alive and also build extra shelters and try to get more people into your shelter. It's a fantastic, if you like worker placement games, this is a great chain. This is a great little twist on it. It's very thematic, even though it's a Euro style game, really enjoy it. Um, I've got the special edition, which has the souped up components, but you don't really need that. They just they kind of hinder more than anything. Uh, your people just keep falling down. But uh, again, recess boards, mm, yes. Um, that's Outlive is my number five. Outlive, number five. Well, my number five is actually, I, I don't think you can call it an uh, expansion because, but this is from Emerson Matsuchi from Plan B Games. And he developed a game called Century Spice Road. But then at Gen Con, they had the Century Golem And edition. next year, you'll be able to get that in the store. Yeah. Well, these are actually available. It's kind of interesting. I had picked up a couple copies of them, one for a friend and ended up not needing it. And so I was trying to get move off the other one, find out that they actually had it on the website, the Golem edition, but it's supposed to be coming out. Um, it's, it's an amazing little game. I think it blows away splendor uh, for me. Yeah. So a uh, really great little engine building, easy, accessible, comes with great components. It has four little white trays with all the gems in it. Um, I think the theme of this over the spices is better personally. Uh, I haven't played Century Spice Road. I've seen it and so forth, seen people playing it, uh, but I love it. It's a, it's a great family weight with maybe just a little notch above. Uh, great game, Century Spice Road, Plan B Games, my number five. Mm -hmm. Okay, played it. Yeah, I didn't find it as fun as, as Splendor, but um, that's just me. Anywho, number four yeah. is um, a game 
from uh, Horrible Games, and it is a relaxing Zen game called Dragon Castle. In this oh. game, it's based on the um, uh, the solitaire computer version of Mahjong, where players are going to be taking tiles off and adding them into their own little player board, building up their own castle. When they make like a connection of four of the same color, they can turn them over and they can score for those. And there are different scoring mechanisms in the games and different special powers. So each game is slightly different. The game is elegant. The game is zen. The game is is just so much fun. It's very easy to learn and just oh, wow, amazing family game. That's my number four, Dragon Castle. Dragon Castle. Who makes that again? Horrible Games. Horrible Games. Yeah, they did Potion Explosion. And yes. We had Alejandro on the, on the show a while Shows, back. Yeah. We did indeed. Well, um, I have to go with my number four. Uh, I have to give a little, uh, I don't know, full disclosure, we'll call it that. Arcane Wonders is our sponsor. Uh, I have a special affinity for this game. But in 2017, Brian Pope and Jason Medina, who I both know very well, designed this game. But this game is Spoils of War. Mm. Um, I honestly had not played Liar's Dice before. I had seen a Liar's Dice poke, uh, tournament by Richard Borg, um, but Spoils of War, it just takes Liar's Dice and takes it to another level. The reason it does is because there are cards that you're playing out, and it's kind of a set collection. You collect a certain amount of cards, and you're going to get a certain amount of points. And if you collect them across the board, one of each, you're going to get extra points for that. And you're betting with one another. And it's this, I, I think it's a little bit group dependent. You know, if you have a bunch of Euro players that just want to study the board and don't want to talk and, and you know, that it's not, it, it's not going to be near as much fun. So it might be a little group dependent. I would say that. But on the other hand, Every time we play this game, we just have a blast playing this game. We just played it at BGG Con. We were out and having dinner afterwards, and we had enough big enough group. We decided to, hey, let's pull out spoils. Man, we just hooted and laughed and had a great time. And you can add two games together and play up to 10 players. We did that at the Fergus Falls Library. We had 10 players around a Watson game topper. That's that's a 60 inch by 38, and but 10 players. We're all around it, and we are having a blast. I mean, everybody loved it. They're like, hey, can I get one of those? Where can I get one of those? Um, so we've had those experiences, and um, while it you know, it might be a little group dependent, love it. Number four, Spoils of War by Arcane Wonders. Okay, moving swiftly along. And I even have a, I even have a promo card. Before he shows you the promo card, moving swiftly along <laughs> and sells a table. <laughs> <laughs> my number three is a game that Berkey has talked about already in the show it's a game where you're racing across a forest or a desert or swimming across a lake to get to El Dorado yeah. yes my number three is the the deck building fun family game of El Dorado um apart from the component quality which is mosh which means crap in French um it actually doesn't it just means ugly um it's a fantastic game. It's fun. I enjoy playing it. It works really well, even with two players. Um, the two-player challenge is just as fun as playing with four players. Fantastic game. Um, El Dorado. He's going to sleep. Oh, he's, he's going to sleep. <laughs> no, I'm just typing out. Um, if anybody wants to get a promo card for Spoils of War, the Berkey Shield, email me at Berkey at boardgametheater.com, and I'll be happy to mail you out a Berkey Shield promo card. Uh, it's just a fun little card for Spoils of War. Um, so, yes. Three. With that, number three, I can't believe this, but Barry, Barry, Quest for El Dorado, number hey. three. Incredible, huh? Yeah, and we I did, tied. I didn't even look at your list. Seriously, when I did yeah, this list. Well, I kind of agree with you. I think the components, you know, they could have maybe spruced it up, but it's fine. Um, and we we never complain about the components because the game's just a lot of fun. It's accessible. It's a great little race, great deck building. So 
Quest for El Dorado, Ravensburger, my number three. Okay, number two is another game which involves guess, guess, yes, trees. It is photosynthesis this time. Photosynthesis. Um, <laughs> yes. This is the fantastic abstract game which has so much theme. It's where you're just growing trees. You are a race of trees and you've got to grow trees and then kill yourselves to get points. <laughs> Sounds crazy, but it's a fantastic brain burning, as I said, abstract game, but it looks jolly and th there's so many options. Although the game is always the same at the beginning, after a while there's the game just goes wild. It's it's calm, it's peaceful, it's 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 wonderful. One of my favorite games of the year, as it's in number two, obviously. Photosynthesis. Bill. Oh, it doesn't let me do a web address. You're correct. Yep. At boardgametheater.com. All right. <laughs> no problem. I didn't know you couldn't do that in the chat. No, you're not allowed to. Oh, well. My number two, Photosynthesis was one of my honorable mentions. I have played it. I own it, and I really like it. Um, but it just didn't make the top ten. So, Man, You said uh, you struggled. <laughs> and I hoodled. You struggled. And you hoodled. I struggled. Yeah, okay. yeah that, was, that was right up there. Yeah. Okay. I, um, this is a game that I think has gone way under the radar. I <gasps> played this game at MeepleCon in uh, at the Gamma Trade Show after the Gamma Trade Show last year, um, and it was before it was uh, or in not last year in March. Excuse me. Um, it's ah. from Yellow Games. Ooh. All right. Ah. Arena of the Gods. Arena of the Gods from Yellow Games. Uh, this game plays at two to six players. It takes about an hour to play the game. Uh, what's happening in it, it's really, in my opinion, it's kind of like, as, as like Spoils of War is, is di uh, uh, Liar's Dice on steroids. Arena of the Gods is King of Tokyo on steroids. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit different in that you're rolling dice King of Tokyo style, Yahtzee style, but you have 20 health points. And what you're going to do is you're going to use those 20 health points to draft these four different special abilities. Movement, uh, defense. My thing keeps going on. Sorry. Uh, movement, defense. Uh, attack power, and then a special magic ability. And so you might really, really want that fast movement, or you might really, really want that defense or that attack, um, but do you spend four of your health points out of 20 to get it? Well, you're battling auction style draft, you know, with each other where you're bidding. So, but it's your health points. And then you're going into the arena and you are, are going to get these objectives and you take out your other opponents in the arena. And so it was fantastic. I just think this game is is brilliant. I played it uh, with uh, Derek Porter from the Dice Tower and from Z Garcia. And Z said he thought it was one of the best games. And I said, yeah, I got to go try it. And sure enough, it's like that game is brilliant. And I don't hear anybody talking about it. It's it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen it a lot over here at conventions and stuff and never got around to playing it. So. Yeah. yeah, it's great. I'd highly recommend it. Okay, no problems. I'll, if I see it on the table again, I'll jump on it. Okay, now we get to the number ones. Number one. Can you guess what my number one is? No. Probably not. <laughs> French, my, right? It's French, yes. My game <laughs> is our Kickstarter again. It's no surprise to probably everybody. That, that, it's that, the that, seventh that. continent. A, yes, yes. It, a adventure game where you choose your own path and it's done with cards and it is so engrossing and so in depth and so frustrating when you die that you have to go back to square one and start all over again and it will be different when you go all over again it's a fantastically produced story with so much depth even even with the soundtrack i had to say it i didn't want to say it but <laughs> no you can say it the soundtrack. Barry, I'll say it for you. Barry made a fantastic soundtrack for Seventh Continent. Go check it out. Okay. And I'm not just saying that because 
I did it. Okay, this is the most played, the second most played game of last year um, after Takin Takinoka, not Takinoka. Onitama. Onitama. That's the one. <laughs> Fantastic fun. Uh, all if playing on your own or playing with someone else, it's a great adventure. That's the seventh continent. Where can people get your soundtrack? They can download it free from uh, Serious Pulp Seventh Continent dot com site, and also from blah, 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 uh, CD Baby dot com. You have a link on everybody, uh, everybody on your from, website. Yeah, there's a link on my website, <laughs> boardgameseverybodyshoot.com as well. Okay. Board games everybody. Yep. And your number one, Berkey. My number one is a theme that I thoroughly enjoy. I uh, got to play this at the Cool Mini or Not Expo with Tom Vassell, Richard Lanius, Derek Porter, and Eric Lang. And it's designed by Eric Lang. And it is... God Breach. Godfather, Corleone's Empire. Uh, this is an area control game. Uh, it's typical Eric Lang fla uh, flair, cool mini or not production. Uh, I have played this game seven or eight times. Um, I love The Godfather. You know, when did I ever refuse an accommodation, you know? This game is brilliant. I love the way there's tension on whether or not to take a certain territory, uh, how that stacks over the game, over the five different years that you're you're playing it. Uh, the component quality is fantastic. Uh, it plays really good at two players, surprisingly. Uh, my daughter loves this game. She played it. People who don't like area control games like this. So, Godfather, Corleone's Empire, big, big hit for me. Love it. I highly recommend it. Well, there you go. That was our top 10 from 2017. Let's just quickly reel off our uh, viewers here who are live joining us. Uh, we have James who says uh, Century Spice Golem is his number two, but Azul will be his number one. Ah. And Spooky Kid agrees with me. It'll either be uh, Seventh Continent or Pandemic Legacy Season 2. And then over on our Board Game uh, Geek Forum, 2248, our Board Game Geek... Uh, our Board Game Geek... Oh, can't do it. A board Game <laughs> Geek... Ge 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 <laughs> <A> board... <laughs> this show's going to go on a lot longer now. Um, <laughs> and over on our board game Geek Guild 2248, uh, James has written that his top five list would include Magic May, Seventh Continent, Deja Vu, SOW, whatever that is, and Fugitive. So, some interesting choices. Well, I think it has a, a lot to do with the games that are out there that, that you know, there's so many. I, I, you know, I hear Azul is fantastic. I hear Seventh Continent is yeah. fantastic. There's, there's a bunch of games. You know, I haven't played Gloomhaven. No. Um, I hear but it's that's fantastic. The thing, it's the, the, the spawnability as well. The spawnability, French word. Um, but their availability. So Azul, you can probably get everywhere, whereas Seventh Continent is very hard to get hold of. Um, so. I think that's one of the things I love about Board Game Geek Con BGG Con is that they have the hot games room and they bring over these games from Essen and he spends all he spends a lot of money to do this but I got to play Merlin that was my honorable mention the new Stefan Feld game I really like Merlin I only played it once but I really liked it um, that could have easily been moved down to nine or ten but I just like Fox in the Forest and Immortals just a little bit better uh, you know, I played Gentis. I played Clans of Caledonia. So those are some big hit games. Uh, it's kind of amazing. I did want to make one uh, little little uh, notation here, and it has to do with expansions in 2017. Not exhaustive, just a couple things that came to my mind. Excuse me. The first one is Scythe, the Wind Gambit. I really think that added a lot. The miniatures are great. I like that it's just a, a, a simple add-on to Scythe, so I really think that was cool. Uh, this is probably my favorite expansion uh, of the year, and I think it's a must-have expansion, personally. 
Uh, and this is the expansion for the hit game Champions of Midgard from Gray Fox Games. They've done the Valhalla and the Mountains expansion. They kickstarted it, but now they're making it available as expansions. I love it. That Valhalla. So if you go on a on a quest and you lose some of your Viking dice warriors and and you, you feel like, oh, that just set me way back. All of a sudden now they go to Valhalla, you get some stuff back, and now you can kind of re, re redo some things. It's fantastic. The mountains expansion. And lastly, uh, for expansions is is this is my baby. I gotta say, I love this. This is the new Star Trek Ascendancy game from Gale Force 9. And they have the Borg, the Cardassians, and the Ferengi. And you gotta love the Ferengi. Quack! These two grubs are children. Oh, ain't we lucky? He's just turned into a hot <laughs> <laughs> suit. We're losing you, Berkey. We've lost him. Is he frozen? Let's have a look. Yep, he's gone. Uh, just at the right time. I hate to be nasty, but I need to be nasty. He's done his quark every turn. <laughs> Are you there, Berkey? 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 <laughs> Looks like we're going to have to end the show with just me. <laughs> we lost Berkey. Oh, dear. So, um... Berkey went underwater robot again. The yeah, he did. <laughs> so um, I'll wrap up the show all alone. So I'd like to say very special thanks to you guys that have been watching. So James Kabuki, Ben, and all the other guys. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to our sponsors. That the is Arcane Wonders. And, of course, that is Get the... I'll have to edit this in the audio. Um, Berkey's thing, game topics. And we also have to thank, and also, take two, take seven. We also have to thank, I've forgotten it. <laughs> and we also have to thank Game Toppers for their sponsorship as well. Um, you can find us on Board Game Geek, as I said, Guild2248. You can find us on uh, BoardGameTheatre.com and BoardGamesEverybodyShould.com. Um, tune in for our next show. As we said, we're going to have a special guest who is going to be chatting with us and babbling, and we're going to be picking their mind with some games to find out what games they like gaming with. Yes, so um, I'm going to bid you all good night. I need to do this all on my own. Um, I need to click buttons. Um, I don't want that graphic. We don't want that graphic, do Four, we? Eight. Yes, there he is. Hey, I'm back. I'm I was just, just recording alternate versions of the ending for you. Okay, we're going to do a Parallel Universe uh, podcast. We'll be the first. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, that was fun. So I have thanked everybody and the sponsors. And, um, yeah, I've, I've lost the script now. <laughs> well, I'll just give it to you. Hey, thanks a lot, everybody, for joining us on Berkey and Badger. We uh, love to have the interaction on the chat. We have mm -hmm. a super exciting show in a couple of weeks, so you can join us uh, there. Join us at Facebook at Berkey and Badger, or you can join us on Twitter at Berkey and Badger, and also the Board Game Geek <laughs> Guild 2248. Well, the R2D2 and Badger Show. <laughs> Many thanks to our sponsor, Arcade Wonders. Check out all the Dice Tower Essential line of games and Spoils of War. And also many thanks to Game Toppers, your portable gaming solution, your existing table into a high-quality <laughs> gaming solution. Check us out at www.gametoppersllc.com. And also, if you want to help Berkey and Badger, I would encourage you to join Board Games Everybody Should.com. Patreon. 
Uh, Barry has an awesome Patreon, and uh, I don't need any support from you financially. Barry does this and puts a ton more time into production of his videos, and he could use the help with his Patreon. So join him at BoardGamesEverybodyShould.com. Oh, and thank you, Rick. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. <laughs> Just see you there. So, um, thanks, James. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Nice. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks, Kabuki, Ben, Jesse. You're the best. Thanks, man. We need to go, unfortunately. I'd love to keep thanking you guys, but um, it's thank you, Barry. Time. I need to thank you. Him. He needs thank to you, Badger. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Berkey. Thank, thank Batman for me, too. I will do. I'll do, I'll do him in dinner, 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 dinner tonight. So I'm going to. Uh, cook a spaghetti. <laughs> All right. We'll catch you later. Take care. Music. Graphic. We're so glad we had this time together. And now it's time to go. It won't be long until we have another show. So keep us in mind, get online. Berkey and Badger will be back in no time. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs>